is Christina Pistotnik. <laughs> she is very special. She is um, my, uh, my sister in crime. She's the co-owner of Whole Family Health, um, clinical director. Um, she has been at Whole Family Health since its inception in 2010. Um, she, so she's, she's, it's like a, a home. And um, I feel like she's like a home for whole, for whole family health too. Um, she's a registered acupuncturist, fellow of the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine, also member of the um, International Obstetrical Acupuncture Association. She is a fertility specialist and she is loved by her patients. Um, and she is going to share some lifestyle factors with you today that you can all um, start to incorporate. So again, I just want to preface this all with, you know, it is about, we don't want to give you more stuff to get perfect. Um, these are, you know, this is all stuff, um, you know, to, to empower you. That's the idea. Don't get stressed out about this. Um, okay. Um, and feel free to ask us any questions. Again, feel free to message us if you want to book in for a free 15 minute consult. And uh, without further ado, here is Christina. Thank you, Alda. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, and thank you for all the work that you do for Whole Family Health as well. So just a little shout out of love for you. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. So bear with me as I set this up. Can you see that okay? Yeah, okay. So yeah, like um, as Alda mentioned, I have been at Whole Family Health since its inception. Um, and I specialize with fertility and pregnancy. So basically my world revolves around fertility um, and pregnancy. My role at Whole Family Health is to support people on their journey to better health by helping them to feel in control of their well-being. For those of you who are trying to conceive, I support whichever path you choose, whether it's through natural or through assisted reproductive technology. And I focus on optimizing health and fertility through acupuncture, diet, lifestyle, and supplements. I am also really passionate about educating the public and destigmatizing issues such as infertility. So, um, at Whole Family Health, we focus on optimizing fertility through optimization of overall health. So for centuries in Chinese medicine, the approach with fertility has been to nourish the soil before planting the seed. Think about it. There is a lot to be said about intention and preparation. I don't know if any of you have tried to plant a garden, but in my experience, once I plant my seeds, I eagerly and often anxiously await for my little seedlings to sprout. Um, but to my dismay, I've discovered that I can't make them sprout and grow when and how I want. I've discovered that the trick is to tend to them with as much patience and care as possible. And I know for myself, patience is always an evolving journey. <laughs> some days I have it, some days I don't, and that is okay. <laughs> so we also understand that it's easy to feel like you don't have control when dealing with infertility issues and that each month that goes by can feel like you're stalled on this biological timeline. So it's our hope to shed some light on whatever you do to control or what you do have control over so that each month becomes an opportunity to continue to nourish your soil and support your seeds. So optimizing your overall health is only beneficial and every cycle dedicated towards tending to your garden, even when it results in another period, is still a step towards a healthy baby. You just can't go wrong with trying as best you can to be as healthy as you can. And that said, we don't want to create more pressure, like Alda said. Um, we are all human, so be kind to yourselves. Nobody is going to get this perfect. Consider what I'm about to share like a North Star, a guide. Do your best and consider following the 80-20 rule. So if you follow these guidelines 80% of the time, you're gold. As I mentioned, we want to optimize your overall health to optimize the chance of creating a healthy pregnancy. So lifestyle factors that can pos positively be affected include removing risk factors, nutrition, sleep, and exercise. So removing risk factors. We are typically exposed to many chemicals and toxins on a daily basis. It's important to 
reduce our exposure to environmental toxins because many chemicals and toxins are endocrine disruptors. Basically, this means that it negatively impacts your hormones, which are not only responsible for reproduction, but also for mood, brain function, and metabolism. While toxins and chemicals disrupt female hormones, ovarian reserve function, they can also reduce sperm production and quality. So this isn't just a female reproductive issue, but it's a male reproductive issue as well. An easy place to start is removing known risk factors. Reduce your body's exposure to toxins by eliminating household and personal products containing chemicals known to be disruptive to reproduction. And the, the highest offending chemicals are BPA, phthalates, and parabens. So bisphenol A or BPA, it's in food and beverage cans, plastics, coffee makers, takeout food containers, dental sealants, fillings, detergents, shampoo, nail polish, and cash register receipts. Phthalates and parabens, these are more in our personal care products and cleaners, such as cosmetics, perfumes, lotions, moisturizers, hairsprays, soap, shampoo, nail polish, plastics, detergents, adhesives, and insecticides. So use, try to switch to natural house, household cleaners in non-high touch surface areas and switch to natural cosmetics, soaps, and other personal hygiene products. And if you're buying canned food or reusable plastic water containers, look to make sure that it states BPA free. If it doesn't, then more often than not, it will contain BPA. A handy tool to use is the Think Dirty app. This is an app that you can download onto your smartphone or tablet and scan products for their toxic rating. So even though I do kind of want to mention about um, disinfectants that are used to help um, prevent the spread of COVID, those disinfectants do carry a high toxic load, but it is still really important to use them. So those products can be like the Lysol or the Cavi wipes. Um, so when using them, please just use um, gloves when using them in those high touch surface areas. So now I'm going on to caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, vaping, and cannabis usage. So sometimes I'm known as the fun police when I address this with my patients but it is important to either limit or eliminate these things from your life. Dr. Dunn did co-write an article in the BC Medical Journal on these things. And since reading it, it has been an amazing guide for me to address this topic when it comes up with my patients. So I want to virtually thank Dr. Dunn for providing evidence-based guidance in this area. So first off caffeine, I know a lot of you really can't um, go without starting your day without caffeine and that is okay. Um, there is more recommended limitations to this. Um, and there is kind of conflicting evidence when it comes to caffeine consumption. One study stated that greater than 500 milligrams of caffeine per day resulted in longer conception times. And yet another study stated that more than 200 milligrams per day resulted in higher miscarriage rates. Well, yet another study suggested that women who drank one to five cups of coffee a day and undergoing IUI had higher success rates of pregnancy and live birth rates. So just for reference, typically a one eight ounce cup of coffee, so a small cup of coffee um, is equivalent to 95 milligrams of caffeine, but this does vary by brand and type of caffeine consumed. Given these conflicting reports, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine has given baselines regarding fertility and pregnancy, stating that one to two cups of coffee per day does not have any apparent adverse effects on fertility or pregnancy. So on to alcohol consumption. Most of us um, know that high quantities of alcohol can negatively, negatively impact our general health, but less is known about if it plays a part in fertility rates. However, there are a few studies that suggest that the time to conception is longer in moderate to heavy consumption of alcohol compared to those who abstained or had minimal alcohol consumption while trying to conceive. Again, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine has made suggestions on this and recommends to that no more than two drinks per day when trying to conceive, but no amount of alcohol is safe while pregnant. For myself, when I'm talking to my patients, I'm a bit more conservative than that. I typically suggest no more than five drinks per week um, because alcohol does affect the liver and the liver is responsible for hormone metabolism. Um, so I'm going to talk about tobacco and cigarettes and vaping. 
Next, um, so cigarettes and their smoke contains numerous toxins and has been conclusively shown not to only negatively affect cardiovascular health, but fertility health as well. Dr. Dunn spoke to this as well, so that was great. Um, so basically smoking does have an effect um, by pre like preventing um, ovarian reserve, earlier onset menopause, lower sperm count and reduced sperm function. One study also demonstrated that smoking can even cross generations. So it doesn't only affect the mother, but the fetus and the fetus's gametes as well. So this is the egg and sperm that are developing in utero. So therefore it can be concluded that smoking is something that needs to be dealt with and stopped when trying to conceive and especially when pregnant. So as for vaping e-cigarettes, the, these have become more popular um, these days in the attempt to quit smoking cigarettes. And there hasn't been really any conclusive human studies done in this area. However, there have been animal studies done and those have concluded that it, it does cause um, delayed implantation, uh, low birth weight and deformities to sperm and degeneration of testicles. So it suggested that if nicotine addiction is an issue, it is better to try other methods of quitting rather than going the vaping route. So cannabis usage. Um, it probably comes as no surprise that recreational cannabis usage has gone up uh, since the legalization in Canada, and there is no conclusive evidence that it can cause infertility. However, researchers suspect that it can interfere with a hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. This is a system in charge of ovulation. This is because a 1990 study showed ovulation irregularities in women who took part in, a regular, in regular cannabis usage. As for male fertility, there has been evidence to show that it can reduce sperm motility um, by two to 21%, depending on dosage and concentration of THC. So even though the evidence isn't 100% clear on fertility, it is highly recommended to abstain from cannabis usage when trying to conceive. So now I'm going to um, move on to how we control risk factors when it comes to the food we eat. At Whole Family Health, we do recommend eating a well-balanced diet, especially including leafy greens, vegetables, and small amounts of fruits and berries. Fruits and veggies have high nutritional value. Unfortunately, there can be a downside to eating these nutritionally dense foods. Despite containing essential nutrients, they can also be exposed to pesticides and herbicides, which are terrible for the reproductive system and their hormones. Therefore, it can best, therefore it is best to try to eat um, organic whenever possible, plus organic fruits and vegetables have been shown to be higher in antioxidant contact um, content. So in 2014, the British Journal of Nutrition actually did publish a study on this, and they found that there was lower incidence of pesticide residue than in non-organic comparisons across regions and production seasons, and organic produce was higher in, in antioxidant levels. So we understand eating organic solely can be quite expensive. Um, but if you could try to do so with those that are classified by the environmental working group as um, the dirty dozen and less so with the clean 15. So the dirty dozen, these are foods that carry a heavier toxic load from exposure to pesticides and herbicides. So in order of contamination, this includes strawberries, spinach, kale, collard greens, nectarines, apples, grapes, cherries, peaches, pears, bell, hot peppers, celery, and tomatoes. The clean 15, um, in order of least contamination include avocados, sweet corn, pineapples, onions, papayas, sweet peas, eggplant, asparagus, broccoli, cabbage, kiwi, cauliflower, mushrooms, honeydew, honeydew melon, and cantaloupe. So while I'm on the topic of uh, nutrition, I wanted to mention a landmark study based on the Harvard Nurses Study, which followed over 18,000 women. So that's, that's a lot of women um, over a long-term period of time. Um, looking at the connection between diet and other factors on the development of chronic disease. It made a startling connection between diet and conception. This study associates slow carb, whole food, mostly plant-based diet with a six-fold increase in fertility. So there, there are six main pillars for fertility nutrition that we suggest. So basically stay away from processed foods and refined flour or anything with added sugar. This includes sugars that are marked as natural sugars such as cane syrup or rice syrups. 
And research did find that diets high in refined and easily digested carbohydrates, which means sugar essentially, increase the odds of ovulatory infertility. Uh, so what you should incorporate is whole organic foods, saying yes to lots of colorful veggies, healthy fats like cold pressed oils, flax, nuts, seeds, and avocados, and healthy proteins such as legumes, nuts, seeds, grass, or pasture fed meat. Again, follow the 80-20 rule. We are human and have to have a good relationship with our food. And that means not completely depriving ourselves of food we enjoy. As mentioned previously, it's good to maintain a balanced diet. And with this, we suggest that your plate is kind of divided up into portions. So half your plate should contain um, non-starchy vegetables. So how you can kind of measure it, you can divide up your plate or use your fists. I, I like to use fists as a rule. So two fists equals half a plate. Um, one quarter should be protein. So that's one, the size of one fist and one quarter is carb. Again, size of one fist. And this is in accordance with the new Canada Food Guide. So another thing that we suggest at Whole Family Health is eating the rainbow. Antioxidants come from eating foods that are high in nutritional value, and we recommend eating the rainbow. Different colors of fruits and veggies have different phytochemicals in them, which can account for their pigmentation, but also carry higher antioxidants and are benefit beneficial properties that help to increase oxidative stress and cellular inflammation in the body. Glutathione is one of the body's most important potential antioxidants. And another benefit of glutathione is that the liver needs it to assist in hormone metabolism. So foods high in glutathione include avocados, spinach, and walnuts. So how is antioxidants associated with fertility? Well, the most basic unit of energy that cells need for cellular activity is ATP. The process of ATP production produces free radicals or oxidative stress that can damage any cell in your body, including egg and sperm cells. So ATP production is good, but the byproduct um, or waste products that can, these can be damaging. So the way that our body fights free radicals is with antioxidants, which are found in the colorful foods that I mentioned. So um, I wanna talk a bit about B vitamins and vitamin D. Um, I just kept the supplement section very basic. If you do have any other questions that, um, that can be answered in our um, either 15 minute free consult or send us the message here um, during the questions and I'll try to answer a little bit more afterwards. So another way our body is protected from oxidative stress is with B vitamins. They help provide protection by binding to toxins to pull them out of our system. So foods high in B vitamins include whole grains, fruits, legumes, seeds, nuts, and animal products. So if you're trying to conceive, um, it is also very important to take your prenatal supplements. This is because um, of folic acid. So folic acid is another type of B vitamin and it is essential for DNA synthesis and prevents brain, spine, and spinal cord defects. Prenatals also contain other B vitamins and minerals essential for your health. I typically also suggest vitamin D supplementation because vitamin D is limited in our food, but rather most of it comes from the sun. Um, and they did find that in order for us to get the most optimal absorption from the sun, we would have to only be clothed like 20%. And I know that's not really feasible for us to be walking around in our bikinis all day long. So for that reason, supplementation is more so recommended to, to make sure that you're hitting your, your recommended dose of vitamin D. Um, okay. So, um, and I did want to just mention a study that it was a meta analysis done on adequate vitamin D levels compared to inadequate levels in women undergoing IVF. They found that women with adequate vitamin D levels were more likely to become pregnant and maintain pregnancy. So for those of us living in the great white North stats, Canada states that at least one third of us are vitamin D deficient and low vitamin D also affects bone mood and overall health. I also did want to mention a bit that it is important to talk to a healthcare practitioner about supplementation um, and the dose of vitamin D because it is stored in our fat cells. So therefore it stays in our body a lot longer. And 
it's a small risk, but there is a slight chance of overdosing on the supplement. So that's why it is important to, to speak to your practitioner about what the proper dosage is. So I'm going to move on to sleep. Um, I know for a lot of my patients, sometimes sleep can be an issue. And again, we don't want to cause stress because we know that's the more we think about sleep, sometimes the, the harder it can to fall asleep. But the I just want to note the importance of it. So the American Psychological Association um, has stated that it is best to get seven to nine hours of sleep per night. And when people are not getting the appropriate length of or quality of sleep, the ability to cope with stress uh, decreases. So a retrospective observational study published in Fertility and Sterility, including 656 women undergoing IVF cycles over 15 months, comparing short duration sleepers. So this was four to six hours per night to moderate duration sleepers. This is seven to eight hours per night and long duration sleepers. This is nine to 11 hours per night found that pregnancy rates were highest among the moderate sleepers. So 10% higher compared to long sleepers and 8% higher compared to the short duration sleepers. Um, so really how does sleep impact fertility in both men and women, the same part of the brain that regulates sleep wake hormones, such as melatonin and cortisol also trigger daily release of reproductive hormones. So what can we do about this to help with our sleep? Um, we can work on sleep hygiene. So this will be important in assisting the ability to get good quality of sleep. And these are some things that you can do. So keep sleep patterns regular and sleep, try to sleep between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. If keeping to a routine and trying to wake up with the sun and sleeping when it's dark, it helps to keep the circadian rhythm stable. And the more routine we get into, it just becomes kind of second nature to us. Um, we'll get more tired when, when we're supposed to. If this isn't possible for you though, um, try using things like um, blackout curtains or sunrise light alarms to stimulate those conditions at off times when you can't um, go to bed when it's dark out and rise when it's light. I do have a sunrise light alarm and I absolutely love it, especially in our cold, dark winter mornings. <laughs> um, another thing you can do is stop caffeine intake by a certain time. So as I mentioned, when trying to conceive, maybe you should be limiting your caffeine intake, but in terms of improving sleep habits, caffeine consumption should stop at least um, four to six hours before going to sleep. And another big thing I know can be really hard for us nowadays, but turning off technology. Um, backlit devices, including cell phones, computers, tablets, readers, and television emit blue light. These things that have been shown to reduce or delay the natural production of melatonin in the evening and decrease the feelings of sleepiness. Blue light can also reduce the amount of time you spend in slow wave and rapid eye movement sleep two stages of the sleep cycle that are vital for cognitive, cognitive functioning. Oh, that was a mouthful for me, obviously. <laughs> Turning off backlit electronics um, is suggested at least 30 minutes before going to bed, but I tend to say uh, try for an hour. If you can't, then 30 minutes minimal. Also, you can try to relax your mind um, prior to going to bed. So you might be used to doing last minute tasks, finishing up things prior to bed. However, these things can stay on the mind. So it is best to skip them. Uh, try doing relaxation techniques like meditation or breathing exercises. So mindfulness practice is amazing for that. Um, and I'll just spoke to that earlier. Spend time outdoors. That's the last um, little tip for sleep hygiene. Spending time outdoors at least an hour inside in sunlight each day can help with the quality of sleep and the ability to fall asleep a little bit easier. Um, so this hour doesn't have to occur all at once. You can break it up into increments and um, so that you can fit it into your schedule a little bit easier. So have lunch outside, take walks, uh, play with children, pets outside. So I'm going to um, talk a bit about body weight and exercise. So BMI can play a role in fertility and an ideal BMI based on weight and height falls between 19 and 25. This is the same um, and is that is the ideal situation um, BMI range that 
is best for fertility too, but keep in mind, the BMI calculations have limitations and it doesn't differentiate between um, muscle and different types of fat tissue. While BMI can be important, I typically prefer to focus on whether you are moving or not. This is because a Norwegian study found that women who were in their ideal BMI but were sedentary had more reproductive issues compared to those who are moderately active. Therefore, exercise is important, but there needs to be a balance. For women, too much exercise, for example, more than an hour of vigorous exercise a day can lead to decrease in the production of the hormones that stimulate um, ovulation and can cause ovaries to become underactive and stop producing eggs and estrogen. So it can really um, impact the, the menstrual cycle and that obviously plays a part when you're trying to conceive. So yet for sedentary people, the subtle physiological changes that come from increasing exercise can benefit their odds of conceiving. Basically, it's not recommended to exercise too much or too little. As I said, it's about balance. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends 30 minutes of moderate exercise per day at least three to four times per week, both preconception and during pregnancy. So it can be a bit different for sperm quality and there is conflicting advice. In 2012, the British Journal of Sports Medicine stated that people engaging in exercise for seven hours or more per week, essentially one hour a day had 48% higher concentrations of sperm than those who were engaging in less than one hour per week. Well, another study examining the association between regular physical activity and semen quality showed no semen parameters were affected by high levels or low levels of exercise. However, this is different for men who cycle. It was shown that semen parameters were less in those who cycled more than five hours per week. So cycling should be considered um, if men are exercising and keeping that to a moderate amount. And basically because exercise is good for general health, I typically do recommend exercising um, for male partners as well. So when it comes to assisted reproductive treatments, um, if you are starting ovarian stimulating medications used in IVF or medicated assisted IUI cycles, there can be some modifications about the type and amount of exercise you do. The concern lies in injury to the ovaries because the ovaries are a lot larger than they normally are because they are producing more follicles than they typically do. For this reason, many people, people are told to reduce exercise, especially if they are used to doing high intensity exercises. So it's important to do some light, low impact movements during art because it can improve mood, sleep and recovery. However, there are definitely movements, exercises that you should avoid. And these include, but may not be limited to high impact exercises with quick changes in body positioning. So HIIT workouts, running, vigorous acrobatics, such as trapeze or aerial silks, pole dancing, Pilates, bar classes, swimming, um, exercises that might be okay, subject to your RE's approval. Advice can vary depending on individual cases. These can include walking, light jogging, but not near the end of injections or close to retrieval time yoga, but no twisting or inversions, and light weight lifting, two to five pounds, try to stick to. With all of these, please no quick twisting movements, um, because again, we don't want to cause injury to the ovaries. So that concludes my natural lifestyle factors for fertility presentation. Um, sorry, I know I talked really fast through that. I was trying to, to make sure I wasn't keeping people too long, um, but thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks so much, Christina. Um, so there are some questions here uh, that we can um, just start working our way through. The first one, um, can okay, it was the question about the endometrial cyst uh, in the ovary. Can this be helped with acupuncture or supplements? Christina, did you want to did you want to start on that one? Um, me too. Yeah. Or do you want to take a break from talking? We can both. Um, we can both. Or any of the other practitioners? <laughs> yeah, you can, Alda. Um, okay, I'll, I'll join in with my little tidbits. <laughs> okay, you bet. Um, okay, so yeah, endometrial cyst. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, it depends on the degree. It depends on the severity. I mean, I think um, Dr. Dunn spoke to it 
Um, we're assuming that it's a chocolate cyst. Um, I mean, you know, fertility is the is the is what we're aiming for here, and so um, we do. You know, depending on what your RE, what your what, what your um, reproductive endocrinologist is suggesting, um, we will play a supportive role. Certainly, there are some. You know, acupuncture can help to you know to bring down the inflammation. Um, it is regulatory, so whether we're needing to upregulate or downregulate the blood flow, um, acupuncture will do that. There are some supplements um, that we can recommend to bring down the inflammation, address any, if, you know, if there is, if you're, if you have elevated estrogen levels, it also depends on if you're doing ART or if you're, you know, trying naturally, it kind of, the answer is kind of, it depends. Certainly there's stuff that we can do, not really to, um, depending on how big it is, um, you know, certainly if a reproductive endocrinologist is suggesting to remove it, I think Dr. Dunn said that 38 millimeters was not very big at that point. Um, uh, then, you know, what we can do is to prevent it from growing more, maybe to help bring it down. Sometimes the timeline on that can take, you know, longer. Um, so the answer is it depends. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, Chinese medicine is very individualized. So it kind of depends on a case by case basis. I don't know if any of the other practitioners have anything to add to that. Christina, if you have any, um, anything to add to that before we move on. Um, no, you, you pretty much said it perfectly. So it is a case by case basis and, and acupuncture is, is very regulatory. So yeah, no harm in trying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't okay. know, like then I, then for, I, for supplement usage, um, there is possibility of some supplements, but um, there, there has been one um, really good study about N acetylcysteine and chocolate cysts, um, endometriomas, especially, but, but again, um, this would have to be done on a case by case basis, whether you're using supplements or not. Thank you, Christina. Yeah. Um, the next question, are there supplements that we would recommend to improve egg quality? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the, there is some sort of preliminary evidence um, that, you know, that, that there are supplements that you can take for egg quality. Certainly they can only be beneficial, right? Um, in terms of like hard evidence, um, like, you know, so for example, um, I know that some of the reproductive endocrinologists, they want really, really hard evidence, right? Um, so certainly there's some preliminary evidence, but there, there are supplements that we recommend for, for egg quality. So, you know, CoQ10, PQQ, um, um, myonositol, um, and, um, you know, again, it's a case by case basis, depends on what's going on for you. Again, NAC, the one that Christina mentioned, um, but we don't want you to just go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff, right? So it's always good to consult with a, like with a specialist, with somebody um, who can, who can monitor and just, and really um, customize your treatment plan to you and what's going on for you. It also depends on, you know, if you're undergoing ART or not, or, um, and if you're taking any other medications, right? So there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff to, to factor in. Um, but certainly there, there are, there are, yeah also acupuncture and Chinese herbs. So the idea, I mean, our approach is to optimize your, um, your overall health in that three month preconception time, right? So there's a lot of talk about epigenetics and how um, our, you know, our, um, our DNA is affected by, by the environment around it. It can turn and turn on and off um, gene expression. So the idea is to optimize your overall health during that three month preconception time that we know it takes um, for eggs to ripen and mature and also for sperm to produce in the body. And so if we're optimizing the environment that they're growing in, we're, we're supporting them to, to develop to their peak potential. And I think, you know, I mean, for me in my journey, it was like, I just need, I, I just wanted to know that I was doing everything I, I could. I didn't get it perfect all the time. Sometimes I was terrible. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it was really, you know, it's only, it's only beneficial. Um, to empower yourselves with with these ex, with these things, if you want to explore them, if that makes any sense. Did you have anything to add, Christina, to that, or any of the other practitioners? No. Nope. Okay. 
Um, do we know what the Edmonton Clinic wait times are? I don't really know. I mean, it's, I think it's really, it really varies. I know that they're the busiest they've ever been. Um, I don't know. It's like three to six months, I think. I don't, other practitioners, are you getting a sense from your patients? How long? Um, I do know they're very busy and I think they are more at a, like probably around a three month wait time right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think they do to some degree triage, right? So people, so more urgent cases, I think they do, they do try. Um, yeah, but yeah. it's kind of, it's hard. They are busy right now. Um, next question. Is there a time commitment each day in terms of the schedule or or, oh, this is with the mindfulness. Yeah, so the mindfulness program, it's once it's once a week. It's on Monday evening, 7 till 9.30 at night. It is live. The orientation, which is mandatory, is tomorrow night. And then it is an eight-week program. So altogether, it's nine weeks. Um, and then there's some home practice that we do ask that you commit to. So it is really, you know, it is kind of like brain boot camp a little bit. It's, it's, it's learning, you know, when you go to learn to swim, for example, you, you, you need to, um, you can read about it but it's not the same as actually going to the lessons and, and jumping into the pool um, and um, really exploring and learning um, in an integrated way. So I hope that answers your question. Um, Christina, are there any specific fertility friendly brands that you recommend for skincare? I have noticed that a lot of the um, EWG approved ones can be quite expensive. So oh, environmental okay. working group, environmental all. working group. Um, so uh, honestly, I, <laughs> I know that a lot of the fertile friendly ones can be quite expensive, but I, there isn't just one brand that I specifically recommend. I usually for skincare, I'm, I hate to admit this, but I'm just like a soap and water type person. So I think I just, I find my, I like the soap that I use. I just make sure that it's, it's more on the clean side. Um, the live clean is, is fairly decently priced. Um, but I'm, when it comes to like, if there's, if you're wanting to prevent like breakouts of pimples or anything like that, um, that can be quite challenging. And I know a lot of dermatologists um, do recommend more heavy chemical type things. Um, so I do suggest more so using that like Think Dirty app if you can and, and trying to do a little bit of research. Um, it might take some time to do, but, but it is kind of worth it. Yeah. I know some of my colleagues um, recommend beauty counter oh yeah i forgot oh, about beauty it's supposed to be, yeah it's supposed to be clean and um and good yeah beautiful beauty counter beauty counter yeah you're right i i completely forgot about beauty counter <laughs> thank you all <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um any of you other practitioners um catherine or kelsey or michaela do you recommend anything that i'm unaware of no, no specific brands. I like Rocky Mountain as well. They don't have a lot of chemicals and they have a lot of explanation on the website as well for, for ingredients. So Rocky Mountain is, is another good one. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. There's a long question here in the chat. Um, I'm taking DHEA, 25 milligrams, three times a day. I was told I was insulin resistant from visual appearance, which seems bogus. Um, and the practitioner recommended adding a chromium supplement, did the research and decided to focus on the foods with it versus taking additional supplement because too much chromium, chromium causes damage. Thoughts? Um, oh, and then just uh, confirming that PCRM wait lists are three to four months. Do, uh, could, do you wanna speak to that one, Christina, or? Um, sorry, I was trying to, I got a direct message, so <laughs> I was responding to that. Um, um, 
It's so case by case. I mean, I feel like this is a little bit more detailed. That might be good for you to, to book in for one of those free 15 minutes for us to chat about. But um, yeah, but Christina, go, go, whatever you got, let's hear, give it. <laughs> um, it's sometimes, it can be sometimes hard getting those nutritionally dense food um, only from food sources. So uh, I do, I do typically like to recommend a supplement on top of it, but, but that's, that's my preference. Um, just because sometimes you have to eat an extraordinary amount of those nutritionally dense foods. Um, so, so yeah, again, I, I don't think that it causes, um, like, well, well, too much chromium can cause some damage, but, but having like maybe different supplements and looking at different supplements won't, won't damage things, um, as much. So, so yeah, like, um, oh, sorry, my brain is <laughs> kind of much right now. Um, my own inositol that, that would be one for Picos. Um, and then like a dim supplement that, that's basically what's in um, the brassica genus, so the broccoli food groups. So that's that's my take on it, but it might be best to discuss a little bit further. It would be good to actually just know, know if you are actually insulin resistant. Yeah, so. if you had some tests done. Thanks. Yeah. Anyway, okay, I think that was the last question. So we'll kind of hang out a bit. You guys can feel free to kind of linger. You know, we can unmute. We'll stop recording and we can unmute. Um.